How's it going, everybody? This is Sean from Lumix Live, and, uh, well, we've made it. It is December 31st. Uh, I am pre-recording this session since, uh, you know, I'm taking a couple of day, a couple of weeks off, actually, um, to get ready for 2021, and uh, I wanted to use this, uh, this particular stream to kind of, you know, walk through some of the cameras that we have, all the way down from the LX100 Mark II up to the S1H, the new S5, uh, and cover some of the, you know, kind of big core uh, tips and tricks for the different kinds of cameras that we have out. Um, a lot of people that I've been interacting with and talking with over the last couple of weeks are excited because, you know, you're getting a new camera this year or uh, you may be getting a new lens and, and, you know, this is the perfect opportunity to actually kind of walk through some of those features. Um, now, if you've been following Lumix Live for the entire time we've been doing this, some of these tips have been shared already throughout the season, uh, but I'm going to put them all into one little group here. So let's get going, and uh, we're going to look at my LX100 Mark II first uh, and cover some of the cool features that that camera has if you're getting into a point-and-shoot That'll be relatively similar for all the different kind of point and shoots that we have. If you're a ZS series camera, an FZ series camera. Uh, so let's jump over and take a look at that now. So I have my LX100 Mark II set up right here. Uh, and I'm going to jump over and show you some of the external controls on that camera that are relevant pretty much across the board for any of our point and shoot cameras. Now, one of the things that uh, a lot of people will pick up a point-and-shoot camera for is the fact that you have incredible uh, close focus and macro focusing capabilities without the need to go out and get an external lens or a dedicated macro system for an interchangeable lens camera. So with our cameras, in this case, the LX100 Mark II, it has a physical switch for this, but it'll be the same process if you're using a camera that has to do this in software through the internal menu system. So if I jump over here, you'll see that I have my LX100 Mark II uh, set up here, and you'll see that I'm focused in on the little kind of AF selector switch, which is right here uh, on the lens barrel. So with this switch, when it's set up into regular AF, which is what it's set on now, this will use the standard focusing range for the lens. But you'll notice that you also have another selection right above that, which is AF with a little flower next to it. Now, this is the macro focusing mode for the camera. Now, it changes a little bit about how you're going to, like how close you can be to something and also which... Uh, focal length you're going to use for this. Typically, you're going to be at the wide end on some of these cameras. Some of them you can actually do digital zoom with this and get much, much closer. Uh, but all you're going to have to do to take some of those great macro shots is to flip the switch or in the camera menu, select AF with the little macro icon, and you're able to jump in and be able to capture really close up focus images which are going to be very close to macro. In some cases, they may be one-to-one, -one, but they're going to be relatively close. So when we look at this here, you'll see all I'm doing on the LX100 Mark II is just clicking down on that switch. It's now dropped into that macro mode. And if I turn the camera here and refocus on the screen, you'll see that you're going to get the little icon on the top here that says AF with the little uh, flower icon. That's telling you that you're in that macro mode, you're in that close focus range, and you're good to go for capturing that kind of imagery. Now, you do have some other functionality that you can utilize with macro. So if you're looking at this as just a total point-and-shoot camera, I just got it. I just want to be able to get myself comfortable with taking images uh, on an actual camera like this, then you can leave it in the IA mode. And what's cool is with IA mode... And this is maybe not the best camera to show this one on, but in a lot of our cameras, we'll have this IA functionality. On an LX100 series camera, it's a press button, and then that will put it into the automatic mode. In the other cameras, you'll have it on the actual mode dial up here, kind of like how our point, uh, G100 camera works, which I'll we'll be talking about that camera next. Uh, that will let the camera know when you've put it into that close focus or macro focus mode 
to automatically select the right scene shooting mode for it. Uh, but if you're not wanting to use the automatic modes, once you put it into that close focus mode, it's just going to function like a regular camera does. So you'll still have full control over all your settings, all the options that you would normally have. It just shifts how close the lens can focus. Uh, and one kind of like tip for this, you don't want to use the uh, macro focusing mode for general shooting. So general photography. Um, there's some downsides to it for traditional everyday kind of photography. It will kind of slow down your process a bit, mainly because it's going to prioritize knowing that it has to focus much closer than the normal focus range. So if you're coming from an interchangeable lens system, you're probably used to seeing this as what's called a focus limiter, uh, on some of the bigger end lenses. So like our, um, 70 to 200 millimeter, things like that. Uh, kind of similar process on this. So if you're going to be just photographing regular day to day, make sure you're in standard AF mode. So just AF. And then if you want to do macro shooting, just flip that switch or toggle it in the AF menu. Uh, and then you can select it in there on a FZ camera, the bridge cameras, they typically have really good close focus. Uh, it's on the rear directional pad and it's the same thing. Just look for the little icon that says AF. And then when you click on that, you'll have three options. It'll say AF, macro AF, uh, and manual focus. Some do also have the magnified uh, macro AF, uh, but that's a little bit more of an advanced uh, setup. It lets you get much closer, but it has some uh, more restrictions into how, which focal length you have to use. Uh, so there are a bunch of options there. So... For the next one, I'm going to actually set up and jump over to my G100, and we're going to cover some more of the kind of general basic uh, settings that are going to be really good for that first time you set the camera up. And again, these are going to match well with the point-and-shoot cameras as well as most of the G-series cameras. Uh, the S-series cameras are a little more uh, advanced when it comes to some of these auto functions. So uh, let's get that camera set up now. All right, so I've got the G100 set up now, and we're going to take a look at some of the external settings and kind of cover what each of these dials mean, uh, which, again, is going to be very relevant to a lot of the point-and-shoot cameras, the bridge cameras, uh, and most of the G-series cameras as well. So when you look at the top dial on the camera here, you'll see that we've got uh, our main uh, mode dial up here which is just your standard uh, ASMP, so that's your uh, P is program, A is aperture, S is shutter, M is uh, manual, and those are the photography modes. Then you have the M mode with the little camcorder icon, that's the uh, creative video mode, that's what you're going to get the highest quality uh, video functionality out of on this camera. And then on most of our cameras we'll have some sort of red uh, record button for video, this may be either uh, a solid red button like this, or it may be a black button with a red dot in the middle. Uh, some cameras will have the power switch like this. Others will have it in a different location. And then you have your exposure comp button here. Uh, and again, some of these are going to be a little different in positioning based on your camera, but I'm just kind of covering the nomenclature here so that you have a rough idea of what to look for on your camera. Now, we talked about before some of those settings here for the cameras that are going to have uh, instead of that autofocus uh, selector switch, some are going to have this done through the actual control dial on the back. So you'll have your white balance, which will be WB for white balance. You have your ISO selector here. The little three icons uh, or the five dots here, uh, this is your uh, autofocus selection mode. So this will let you pick what focus mode you want to be on, uh, whether it's one area, one area plus, that kind of thing, depending on the camera you have. And then pressing down is how you get into your drive mode. Now, the thing that I want to cover when it comes to the drive mode for most of these cameras is, uh, depending on the camera you're on, obviously some of the cameras have a dedicated dial for this. So like the S-series cameras here, like this is my S1H, it's underneath the mode dial, there's an actual collar that changes the modes for the drive modes for you. On most of the G-series cameras and the vast majority of the point-and-shoot cameras, this is done in software. 
So I'm going to jump over to the actual menu on my G100 and we're going to show you what those look like and what they do, uh, especially when it's the first time you're getting into a camera like this. It's kind of, there's a lot going on with the different modes, so it's good to kind of get you a rough idea of, hey, this is what this mode does. So let's jump over to that camera and take a look. All right, so now that we're back here on my uh, G100, the actual camera screen here, uh, we're going to click into the camera menu option. And out of the box, you may notice that if you're in full automatic, so that's our IA, which is intelligent automatic, you'll notice that there are a lot of things that are limited for what you can change for your image. So things like white balance uh, are typically uh, kind of way more simplified in how you're actually going to work with them. But you have some control in this mode. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is that if you click on menu, which is the middle button on the rear control dial, you'll see that you can have an actual menu selection here for Intelligent Auto, which if I go into this menu, we'll see Intelligent Auto Plus. If I click right again, I can go to just regular Intelligent Auto or use the Intelligent Auto Plus. For the most part, you can just leave it on Intelligent Auto Plus if you're going to be in, uh, you know, working with it as a fully automatic camera. Uh, this will automatically select scene modes, uh, pick the right one for the scene that you're working on. Uh, it truly does make it a point-and-shoot camera. And I'm a firm believer that if you are new to interchangeable lens cameras and new to photography, especially outside of a cell phone, it's important to get an image that you like. That's why we're doing this. But uh, a lot of times you'll see people will push really hard for you to jump right into full manual or aperture priority or shutter priority and start really customizing and, and you know, owning everything about your image. Um, I take a little bit of a different approach on that. And I know a couple of the people that I work with have this, have a similar mindset in this too, is it's important to get the image that you want to capture because you can always learn from it. Um, the way our cameras are set up and the way a lot of cameras are set up actually give you a couple cool tools for that. And I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, in the image playback that can help you understand how the camera created the image that it took so you can then learn from that experience and say okay hey the camera chose 1600 ISO it shows 60th of a second and this is the result that it came up with so now you can start building your knowledge on what affects what uh, for a certain image and grow from there. So when you're in playback, uh, which I'm in here, you have a couple abilities to click on the display button, uh, which is going to show you the general metadata. So like I was just talking about where you can look at an image after you've taken it to understand what the settings are. You'll see that you have the basics of, you know, 2.5 seconds, F11, 640 ISO. But if you press display again, this is where you get that core information. So you have all of the modes that were active when you shot this camera. So on the right hand side, you'll see it was shot in manual with AFS, center weighted metering, sRGB, fine plus raw, um, and you have all of those different kind of uh, settings there. On the left side, you'll see that you have your ISO, whether or not you used exposure compensation, uh, and so on and so forth. But then as you press down, you'll also, this is where you can get your uh, RGB parade. So uh, red, green, blue uh, luminance levels, uh, looking at the different um, histograms there. Y is your uh, actual luminance um, metering level there. So that's the histogram for luminance. If you press down again, you'll know what color profile you were in and what different kind of settings you may have made to that setting. Press down again if you're in auto white balance. This will show you any of the kind of customization you made to it. And then down one last uh, setting here if you've got an interchangeable lens camera. This will tell you what focal length you shot at, what uh, lens you were using, so that you have all of that information available. So you can learn from this image to kind of see what did the camera choose, what settings were used for this, so that I can learn and apply this to an image that I want to create that may have a similar look in the future. So when we look back at the camera here, uh, you'll see, uh, again, that intelligent auto mode. This will, again, select all that auto stuff. But if I go down here to the actual image, uh, the camera menu, 
uh, which actually I'm going to turn on the information display here. So uh, one little kind of cool tip. If you're in the camera menu and you're not sure which menu is what, press the display button and your menu will change to this look, which will actually give you the name of each of the menus here. So the record menu, motion picture, custom, set up my menu. Uh, not every camera is going to have my menu. Not every camera is going to look identical to this, but this is the current menu system we're working with. So I'm going to jump into the rec menu here. And you'll see aspect ratio because I'm pumping this out over HDMI. It's locked at 16 by 9, but it gives you a, a definition of what that mode is. Aspect ratio, select picture aspect ratio. Picture size, this is where it's going to tell you how to pick. Uh, do you want a large, medium, or small image? Uh, this is basically compression. So do you want a 14 megapixel image, 8 megapixels, or 2 megapixels? Uh, 2 megapixel is 1080p. Uh, 8 megapixel is 4K, uh, and then 14 and a half megapixel is around 5K. It's if you're thinking in the video aspects, but it gives you the actual aspect ratios. Uh, and our cameras give you the rough idea of what um, print size you can make with them right out of camera without any work on them. Uh, these do change, especially if you are sending a file to someone who knows how to work with files for printing. Uh, you can typically get uh, larger sizes out of these if you have it go to a studio that knows how to work with an image. Uh, the next one down here, uh, this is one of the first things that you're probably going to want to change around with when you get the cameras, uh, is your quality. You've got your standard quality, uh, your or you have fine quality. Let me actually turn this display off because it's easier for me to just run through these. So you have fine quality, standard quality, raw plus fine, raw plus standard, and then just raw. So one of the things with the Lumix cameras is our uh, built-in JPEG in the raw files is a bit smaller resolution. Uh, this helps keep the actual raw file size down, uh, speeds up processing, that kind of thing. So if you're someone who likes to review the image for critical sharpness on the camera, shoot raw plus JPEG. Uh, that's typically what I shoot across the board. Uh, there are times where I'm going to want to take the JPEG image, send it right over to my phone uh, so that I can quickly share it out because I like the way it looks. Uh, or I'll have the raw file uh, sent over to the phone so I can do some editing as well. Uh, but raw on its own is giving you a lower resolution preview because it's a raw file. Uh, it's going to have to be processed. So uh, it saves space and it works a little more efficiently that way. Uh, but when you put it into something like Lightroom or Photoshop or any of those raw converters, you're getting a high resolution preview anyway. So uh, when you're looking at the camera, um, figure out which one works best for you. Typically, like I said, I'm shooting raw plus standard, or uh, uh, sorry, raw plus fine uh, for my JPEGs uh, because that's really with the uh, size of memory cards these days. And when you're working with anywhere between 20 to 24 megapixels, you're not going to run into any kind of uh, space challenge, really, uh, for the most part. So uh, look through here, figure out which one works best for you. Like I said, if you're just starting into this, I typically suggest setting up RAW plus Fine JPEG. Uh, gets you the best of both worlds, an easy-to-share image that doesn't need any processing, but then you have that RAW file so you can process it later and uh, create your own style out of that image. Uh, on cameras that don't have dedicated focus... Uh, dials on the back. So switches like how the S1H has. Uh, this is done in the camera menu here. So you'll see focus mode and it's set to AFS. Now in the point and shoot cameras, this is where you'll find that macro focus mode. In the interchangeable lens cameras, this is where you'll find the ability to change AFS, AFF, AFC, or manual focus. Now AFS single point autofocus or single autofocus. So half press the shutter, focuses, locks, you're good to go. AFF, which is autofocus full time. This is kind of a hybrid uh, focusing system. This will autofocus single to start with, lock on a point, but then when you move and it detects that there's enough of a difference there and the subject is totally moved, it will then go into continuous autofocus, reacquire the point, lock on that point and stay. 
Uh, this can be really useful if you're doing, say, like kind of talking heads. Um, not the most useful when you're going to be working with, say, sports or action photography because those are always moving. Uh, so AFF, I don't use it as often anymore, and I know a lot of people have kind of moved away from using it as often, uh, using either just AFS or AFC. Uh, but that's what that one is there for. So we'll go back into the menu here. Uh, then you have AFC, which is your continuous autofocus. So this is just straight up half press the shutter. We'll continue to autofocus. It won't ever actually lock a point, give you that green box uh, confirmation. Uh, it'll just keep focusing and focusing as you're pressing the shutter. Uh, and then you have your manual focus. So that's MF, manual focus. You control all of it. When we back out of here, um, photo styles are obviously our photo style, standard, monochrome. Uh, when you're in fully automatic, so I'm still in that IA mode, you'll notice that you only have two options here. You have standard or monochrome. If I take the camera out of IA and I go to, say, program, go back into the menu, a couple of things you'll notice. A lot more has opened up on this menu, uh, so the... AF sensitivity, filter settings, all those things have now opened up, and that's because you're out of automatic. But in photo styles, you'll see I have a lot more options for my photo styles here. Um, the cine-like profiles, if your camera has it, V-log L, if your camera has it, or V-log if it's in the, the full-frame cameras, uh, and all of those standard uh, color profiles here. Uh, as a cool segue with this, you'll notice that when you go to the monochrome modes, you have a couple extra controls here. So I can turn different kind of color filters on. So if you're coming from black and white photography and you used uh, actual color filters on the lens to get different contrast profiles, you can do that in camera. Uh, but also you have the ability to add, if I scroll down here, grain effect. Uh, grain effect low, uh, standard, and high. This will basically mimic black and white film uh, for low speed, high speed, and kind of standard speed. So think like... 200 speed, 400 speed, and 1600 speed film. Uh, so you can get some really, really cool effects by using the different uh, uh, grain effects on these cameras. Uh, and you'll see that only the monochrome modes in this camera have that option. Uh, as a side note, if you're on the S5, the new L Classic Neo color profile, which is only on the S5 currently, uh, that does also have grain effect for both color, no, uh, color grain and black and white luminance grain. Uh, so that does have some extra functionality that uh, I would love to see come to some of the other cameras. I'm sure a lot of people would love to see that come to some of the other cameras as well. But uh, so, yeah, a couple different uh, profile modes here. Uh, for uh, kind of continuing here, and again, this is across the board for almost all the cameras. Yes, I'm not using the point-and-shoot camera for this. I'm using the G100, but the menus are going to be pretty similar for uh, almost all the cameras now. Uh, color space. We get a lot of people that ask questions about color space. Uh, you have two main color spaces that the camera can shoot in. One is sRGB and the other is Adobe RGB. Now, a lot of people will advise you one way or another. Um, I know that's kind of a generic statement to make. But if you're working and you're just casually... Uh, shooting photos or you're working in, you know, Adobe Photoshop, you're working in, you know, Capture One, you're working in Premiere Elements or, uh, you know, editing the raw files on your mobile device, keep the camera in sRGB. Uh, the reason being is it's the most widely accepted color space. You know that the images are going to look right on pretty much any platform you put them on, on any kind of screen you put them on. Uh, Adobe RGB requires a larger color space for the monitor to be able to play back. Uh, yes, a lot of our phones and a lot of modern uh, computer monitors are capable of reproducing the are close to the Adobe RGB, if not more than it. Uh, but you may run into a situation where if you have your camera set to Adobe RGB, you put it onto a monitor that doesn't support it, the image is going to look really dark with really crushed shadows. Uh, because it's telling it a different color space to work with. Um, the other indicator is if you notice all of your file names start changing from P, so the letter P with a file number after it, if that changes to an underscore with a bunch of letters after it, uh, the 
P indicates that you're in sRGB. The underscore indicates that you're in Adobe RGB. Uh, so something to be aware of. I know a lot of people that are going to be getting a new camera or uh, if you're f for this time actually running through the menus and you may have not done that before with your camera, uh, you may notice some of these things and start playing around with it. That's what that one's going to work with. Uh, if you've been using the cameras for a long time, you're probably looking at the screen going, but I already know this. Um, it's a it's a common thing that a lot of us that work in this uh, kind of industry and spend a lot of time doing photo editing, we know what the benefits of Adobe RGB is. Uh, it is a larger color space. It can work better for certain things. Uh, but for most people, most users, most uh, photographers, just keep it an sRGB. Uh, it gets you an easier way to get into the camera. And then learn about Adobe RGB. See if you have the right equipment uh, at your disposal to actually view it properly. Um, because it's a little bit more involved to work with. So, uh, again, keep that sRGB uh, for that first one. Uh, we're going to skip some of the filter settings because in this camera, it's actually in the menu. On the other cameras, it's actually on a dial on the top. But the uh, kind of last major thing I want to cover on this point before I jump over to talking about some of the more video-focused things here are basically what's on this page. You have highlight shadow, metering modes, eye dynamic, and eye resolution. For starting with metering modes, uh, the vast majority of the cameras are going to have these three options. You have multi-metering, center-weighted metering, and spot metering. Uh, multi-metering will take a look of the entire frame, so the entire image that you're looking at. It's gonna read all of the light coming in, and kind of balance it out to middle gray, because that's what a meter does. The center weighted is going to take just this center region. So it's going to ignore the outlying areas, and it's going to work just kind of like in this area. So if you've got darker shadows, like so I have a black shirt against a black uh, chair, which is probably something I should change for next season. I... Uh, you'll notice that this will be darker than what the rest of the scene's going to be. So the center-weighted metering is going to be viewing this, and it's going to want to actually kind of boost the exposure, which means back here is actually going to get brighter and probably more prone to clipping. So something to be aware of depending on the shooting style that you're working with. Uh, if you're coming from a film camera, because um, I know there's a lot of people that still shoot film, I would love to shoot film if it wasn't as cost prohibitive these days. Uh, center weighted metering was a common way. Uh, the most common way for a lot of uh, film shooters was spot metering. Spot metering literally takes the center spot of the camera. And when we select spot meter on our cameras, you'll see that I get that little blue crosshair in the middle of the camera. That means that the camera will meter for exactly what's under that spot. So if I move this onto the desk here, uh, and you can see the mess of cameras I have on my desk as I've been working um, to get all this stuff together. You'll see that the exposure really, really brightens up. But then if I move it over to the really bright, uh, well, not really bright wall, but the white wall there, you'll see that the image gets really gray. Uh, if I move it into that kind of middle shadow there, you'll see that it kind of balances out the exposure. So what that's doing is it's really isolating where it's taking the exposure metering to tell you what would be a good shot. So you can play around with these. I highly advise people to typically be in center weighted metering. Uh, it's, in my opinion, one of the most flexible because there are going to be times where you want a specular highlight. So that is anything that is a pinpoint of light that you know there's no information in it. It's okay that it becomes a pinpoint of light. Uh, so going into center weighted means that if I have like a pinpoint of light up here, uh, or if I have the uh, LEDs lit on the tapestry I have back here, it's going to let those actually blow out to be totally, you know, pinpoints of light. That's fine. Uh, but it's going to balance the mid-tones exposure. So my shirt, uh, my skin tones, they're going to look a little bit more natural. Uh, so this gives you a good balance to work with. Uh, so start with center weighted metering is usually where I suggest people go to. Uh, and you should be good to go there. Now, the next one here is highlight shadow. This is tone curves. 
Uh, if you've ever worked in Photoshop or Lightroom, you know that you can make, you know, play around with tone curves to increase uh, shadow and highlight sharpness or uh, shadow and highlight detail. So you can make an inverse curve with this uh, where you're going to have basically the ability to come through here and change these to like a severe S curve, which is going to be ultra contrasty or an inverse S curve, which is going to be very flat and kind of neutral. Uh, there's a couple custom ones in here, which are, uh, are pre-programmed ones, which are increased contrast, lower contrast, brighten the shadows. Uh, you can save three custom ones in here. So this gives you a lot of play around with the actual settings in the camera to get a look that works best for you. Now, the last two things I'm going to cover before I jump into the next section here is eye dynamic and eye resolution. So when you look at eye dynamic... Uh, the explanation we give here is contrast and exposure is adjusted automatically. What this means is that it's going to balance the dynamic range of the image to kind of give you the best, what, what the system believes is the best looking image. Uh, so that means that it's going to adjust contrast in the highlights and shadows to bring the highlights back a bit and bring the shadows up a bit. Now, something to note is that this only works for JPEGs. This will not be attached to your RAW files. You'll still have to do that kind of work to your RAW files. Um, typically, honestly, I recommend leaving this setting off uh, if you're going to be shooting for the first time. Mainly because you typically, when, when you let a camera start changing the contrast di dynamically, like, like it says, eye dynamic, uh, you're probably going to end up getting a flatter looking image than you would intentionally want out of the camera. A lot of times we like vibrant colors. We like uh, images that have a lot of pop to them that uh, really kind of look close to what our natural uh, vision of that site is. Uh, when you use iDynamic, it's going to flatten it out a bit because it's, expand it's showing you a bit more of an expanded dynamic range. Think somewhere of a balance between HDR and standard dynamic range. So you can leave this one off. Uh, it's a simple, low, standard, high, or auto. Um, if you do want to play around with it, obviously, it's your camera. Play around with it. Um, just because I, I recommend something or somebody else recommends something does not mean that that's a definitive answer for you. Um, play around with these. Some, it may work incredibly well for your style of shooting. Uh, but I would typically not go over the standard. You go to high, you're going to start getting really, really... Uh, lifted shadows and pulled back highlights, and it may look way flatter than you would expect it to. Uh, now, the last uh, setting I'm going to cover here is called eye resolution. Now, eye resolution is a mode that basically it's um, intelligent sharpening added to the images, and you have different steps for it here. So you'll see low, standard, and high. Uh, what this will do is it uses algorithms that we've built in, the way we know how the sensors work, the way our processing works, uh, and it can add additional sharpness to the image that you're getting out of the camera. Again, this is only in JPEG, so your RAW files are not going to be affected by this. Uh, and in some cases, you're going to want to play around with it if you do want to work with this. Uh, it will add... Uh, a decent amount of sharpening to an image that can look great on a smartphone, can look great for kind of just, you know, web viewing. Uh, but if you really want the best control out of your image, uh, typically leave this off and do sharpening in something like Photoshop or Capture One or one of the software that you're working with. Um, be careful if you have it on and say you throw it into Instagram and use their sharpening capabilities you'll get a lot sharper of an image than you're expecting out of it. Uh, and that's where you can get some really weird looking artifacts out of it. So play around with them, see which one works best for you. Uh, and from that, we're going to jump over to one of my S series cameras. And we're going to go through some of the more advanced settings on this um, to cover different things like uh, luminance spot meter, stuff like that for video. So let me get my S1H set up and we'll jump over to that next. All right, so I've got my S1H set up now. Uh, really simple setup here. Now, if you're used to working with uh, the interchangeable lens cameras, specifically in the S series cameras, you'll know that there are a ton of photo and video functionalities in these cameras that 
uh, really are fairly unique to the industry. Um, if you've just got yourself an S-series camera, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here is going to be the same across the S1, S1R, S1H, and S5. Uh, so these are kind of the much more advanced functionalities that these cameras have. Uh, and again, this is by no means a total collection of everything that these cameras can do. Uh, we have an entire selection of videos, which I will link to the playlist here, uh, that will walk you through all the different menu options here. So there's so much more about these cameras, but uh, this one is really just going to be focused to kind of those core things that I think most people are going to be uh, wanting to use uh, when you first get this new camera. So we're going to jump over here. Uh, again, we're looking at my uh, S1H screen here. And one of the uh, first things that I like to point out in our uh, S-series cameras is that box that I have up here in the top. You'll notice that I have a box that I can move around here, uh, and that gives me a little percentage icon down on the bottom here. So you see it's at 69 now. If I move it down into the shadow of that image, it's down to 10%. That's what's called luminance spot meter. So one of the things that you'll see with uh, this camera is, again, that luminance spot meter functionality. So you can get to that by clicking into the menu. And because I'm in the video functionality right now, uh, this is going to be primarily video functions that I'm going to be covering here. Uh, but this is usable in pretty much any of the modes. They mean different things depending on what uh, camera mode you're in. Uh, but we're going to be addressing it from the video functionality side. So for luminance spot meter, we're going to go into my different settings here, and we're going to start up at the top here. And actually, if I remember exactly where to go in the menu, that would be lovely. Um, so let's go to luminance spot meter here, which is going to be under, and again, I'll do uh, the display button here so you can actually see which menu. So we're in the custom menu. We're on monitor, uh, monitor display photo, and we're on the second page. So here, when I go in, you'll see I'm going to scroll down to luminance spot meter. So what this does is it's telling you what the luminance is of that particular area. So that particular where that box is covering, that's what the luminance is of that uh, image or that particular spot in the image. So right now I have that on. So as you can see, it's 10% there. If I scroll over here to something maybe a little bit brighter, it's 14%. If I go to the white, it's about 68. If I go up into this corner, 71, because it's closer to the lighting over here. Now, where this is most useful are situations where, say you're going to be exposing with V-Log. So you're going to be shooting in a logarithmic color profile you'll notice that that number changes depending on the color profile you're in. So right now, it's in a percentage. So if I jump back here, you'll see that again, it's in that 71%. But if I go in here, if I leave that where it is, go into my quick menu, and I change my color profile to V-Log, come back to shooting, you'll notice that that's now saying plus 1.2 stops where if I bring this down into the shadow region, it says negative 3.3 stops. Now, the reason this changes is the way luminance spot meter is going to actually function best for you is if you're someone exposing V-Log, you know that the 18% gray or mid-tone should be exposed to 42 IRE. Uh, IRE is the uh, rating for uh, the different values for your exposure. Um, we can go into much more detail about that in a separate video. But at 42 IRE, that's where mid-tone should be uh, exposed. Now, you would ideally do this with some sort of gray card uh, that is going to be rated for mid-tone or gray. Uh, and Color Checker makes a, a bunch of them. I use a Color Checker Passport, the video edition one. Uh, so I can set my shot up, hold that in the frame, drag the little luminance spot meter on it, and if that says zero... That means that my mid-tones are properly calibrated to 18% gray, uh, or 42 IRE for those working on that scale. 
Because of the way Vlog is designed, that means that if I want to get my highlights, I have up to six stops above that midtone that I can pull information back from. So a lot of people have talked about, you know, you want to ETTR or expose to the right. Uh, and you can do that. That is one method to expose uh, your images properly. That does mean, though, that in post, you're going to have to be pulling your exposure back to get your midtones back to that 42 IRE so that skin tones fall in the right range and then everything else kind of falls into place. Um, ETTR is a really quick way to do it. This, I would say, not to not as a, a slight to anyone doing ETTR, this is the correct way you should work with it. Um, with full knowledge that it's not always practical to work this way. So before people start yelling in the comments, I understand that this is not always the best way uh, to work with this. So uh, what you'll do with that, that 42 IRE is uh, when you set your midtones to be that, that uh, zero, zero stops, you can then drag this point. So if I come here and drag this point around to something different. So say I bring this up into here, you'll see that's plus 1.1. But if this, uh, if the image frame was actually set as 18% uh, gray, that would read zero. That means that the highlight part of this image, even though, yes, this is a photograph, so not the best example of it, I would know that I have up to six stops to play around with in all of my highlights for that image. But more importantly, it means that I can drag this point around to my shadow region and know that theoretically you have around eight stops under exposure that you can work with. You don't necessarily want to just dump all the way down to eight stops and then pull it up in shadow. That's where you start getting some more noise in V-Log or any kind of logarithmic footage. Uh, but you, you know that there's information that can be pulled all the way down into eight stops. But I can balance this out and say, okay, I know I want my shadows to say somewhere around five stops underexposed. I don't really want to go anything below that uh, because you're going to start introducing too much noise for some, some looks. I can use this, find the darkest part of the region, see where that is landing on the scale, and then I can light it accordingly. Uh, especially if I know that, okay, my highlights are right where I want them. Say my highlights are at five stops over, or four stops overexposed, but my shadows are coming in at about six stops underexposed. Um, if you're in an environment where you can actually light it, uh, you can now then look at it and say, okay, I need to add some kicker lights into the shadow region to start bringing that exposure up into where I know I can balance this out with a different LUT. Uh, or in my color grading, I can actually balance this out and make it look the way I want it to. So the luminant spot meter is going to be probably one of the best tools that you'll have to get a properly exposed image. Uh, where you're not going to have to necessarily spend as much time in post uh, really playing around with your highlight and shadow levels. Uh, you can map an entire frame with luminance spot meter to know where your highlight maximum di dynamic range is, where your shadow maximum dynamic range is, to get the best looking image out of it. So the next one that we're going to cover is actually going into the menus again. So let's jump over and take a look back into the camera for the next setup. So now that we're back here looking at the main display on the camera, uh, the next thing I want to cover on this is the LUT uh, loading that you can do on the majority of the S series cameras. Uh, so the cameras that have V-Log have the ability to load a preview LUT into the camera. Now this allows you to have the ability to shoot in V-Log, but still also have your kind of rough idea of how the image is gonna look after you bring it into your editing suite. Now, because this is a Panasonic product, we work in the .VLT, which is the Vericam LUT uh, file format. So we have an entire collection of these available, which I will uh, leave a link in the description to where you can find the official Panasonic Lumix LUTs or the Panasonic Vericam LUTs, sorry, uh, which will work 100% on this. But 
the thing that often gets overlooked with being able to put those LUTs in the camera is how to actually do it, for one, but also, okay, so I have these LUTs, but when I put them on the camera, nothing is recognized. So to start with, we're going to click on the camera menu, and we're going to go into Vlog View Assist, which again, if I click on Display and go over here, you'll see that it's under Custom, it's under Monitor Display Video, and it's on page one, is Vlog View Assist. So once you go into here, you'll see LUT Select, LUT View Assist Monitor, and LUT View Assist HDMI. So a couple things to cover here, uh, and I'll start at the bottom. LUT View Assist HDMI. What this does is this pushes the uh, LUT image, so the HDMI image out right now is in VLOG. So that's why on the background of this, it looks really flat and kind of washed out. But if you're working on a monitor, and very clearly a monitor, not a recorder, uh, and that monitor doesn't have the ability to load LUTs into it, you can have the camera push the in-camera LUT out over HDMI so that you can view it on a monitor and have an easier time seeing focus peaking, um, judging what the colors are going to look like roughly when you're actually ready to get into editing. So uh, LUT View Assist HDMI, if I turn this on, what you'll see is that image in the background now looks color. It looks like a 709 conversion. Uh, and that's because the LUT I have selected is VLOG to 709. Now, the one above that is LUT View Assist for the monitor. Now, monitor uh, determines parts on the camera. So that is the rear LCD and the viewfinder. So I can also come in here and I can also turn that on. Now what that means is when I look through the viewfinder or I look on the rear screen of the camera, I'm actually going to be viewing it in Rec. 709 or whatever LUT that I have loaded onto the camera to actually see the image in. I don't have to look at the image as VLOG. Now, when it comes to selecting those LUTs, that's under LUT Select. So you'll see you have VLOG 709 is the default that's included in the camera. That's always going to be there. You've always got the straightforward 709 conversion. But then you'll notice that you have four additional ones that can be selected in here. Now, by default, these will all be blank, so you won't really be able to do anything with them. Um, LUT not registered if you go to click on it. Uh, and the reason for that is that these are the slots where you can load in your own LUTs. So again, these LUTs need to be in the .vlt file format. Now, the link that I'm putting in the description is going to bring you to the Panasonic uh, Vericam LUT page, which is the entire pack that we have for Vericam. You have two different versions on there. You have camera monitoring LUTs and editing LUTs. The monitor LUTs are going to come down as .vlts. Now, for most of the time, pretty straightforward. You may look at that and say, okay, well, all I have to do is drag that, put it onto the root of the memory card. So the same, uh, same process you do for a firmware update. I take that .vlt file, just put it on the memory card, not in any folder, just put it on the memory card. Um, and that lets you bring it over into the camera. But the catch that gets often overlooked is you have to rename them when you're going to actually put them into the camera. You'll notice that when I go back into the menu here, that the VLOG to 709 is uh, eight characters long. Uh, the reason being is the file format structure has to be eight characters. So it will be VLOG underscore 709 dot VLT for this particular one. So say you want to bring over the nicest 709 LUT that we offer on, you know, from the Vericam series. You can put that on here. You just have to rename it to only be eight characters long with the dot VLT. So anything after, you know, the dot and the extension, that doesn't count. So it's eight characters, then dot VLT. Once you put it onto the memory card, you'll be able to come in here and the first thing you'll notice is that this read LUT file will light up when you have a card in here that has the, the LUT files on it. Then you can store it and say you want that one set on 
uh, set one through set four. And you'll see that these will repopulate with the corrected name. The cool thing is you don't have to have these staying on the memory card that you're working with. These will store in the camera, so you can take the card out, you can format it, do whatever you want. They're stored there, you're good to go. Uh, so, again, recapping, make sure that they're eight characters in length uh, for the naming structure, and the .vlt files can convert over onto this camera. Uh, and it's the same for any of the cameras that use um, this system, so the GH5, GH5S, uh, the S1, S5, S1H, uh, since they can shoot V-Log, the S1R does not shoot V-Log, so you don't have the LUT assist available on there. Uh, but yeah, you have the functionality to be able to add those in. Uh, again, and I, I reiterate this a lot because it, it's one of the biggest questions that comes up about loading LUTs onto the camera is why won't it find them? They, they have to be eight characters long uh, for the naming structure. Uh, the last thing when it comes to the look, uh, the view assists is our HLG view assist. So those that want to shoot in the hybrid log gamma functionality, you'll see that we have HLG view assist, which again, it's on the same page. If I come into here, you'll see monitor has two modes. You have mode one and mode two. Now, the reason there's two modes is because the monitors on these cameras are not um, high enough uh, nits, so they're not bright enough to actually display a full HLG or hybrid log gamma or HDR image. So you have two different settings here. Mode one, which is it displays the Rec. 709 converted image while giving priority to the bright areas in the image. So the image may look dark because you're shooting to view for your highlights. Then you have mode two. So uh, actually I have that backwards. Um, mode one giving priority to bright areas in the image. So it's going to look fairly okay across the board. Uh, mode two gives priority to the brightness of the main subject. That means that your mid tones are going to be where the priority for view assist is. Uh, so HLG, it is a hybrid HDR uh, viewable format. So if you put it on a TV that's only standard dynamic range, it's going to compress it. Um, you're going to clip all those highlights out, uh, but it, it can function on both uh, types of displays. Uh, because this is standard dynamic range on the monitors on these cameras, this mode lets you say, okay, I want to prioritize to make sure that my highlights are being recorded properly, that I'm not going to blow them out even in HDR. Uh, or in the uh, uh, main subject area, I want to make sure my mid-tones are actually coming in where they should come in. So it's all visual there, uh, but it gives you a good representation of what the image is going to look like when you're ready to actually start working with it in post. Now, the cool advantage with working with HLG is that if you throw it in something like Final Cut, uh, it'll recognize that it's HDR footage, and you can just start working with it there. So it'll set your scopes up right, all that kind of stuff. So uh, the last thing on this menu is HDMI. Now, HDMI has the same setups. You have Mode 1, Mode 2, but you'll notice that you now also have Auto. Uh, the cool thing with this is that if the monitor that you're attaching this to is HL HLG compatible and it can accept the signaling that comes from the camera, uh, it will display it in HLG. So if you plug this into, say, like my TV or you have an HDR TV and you're viewing it, um, you'll get the icon on the TV that says HDR content uh, and you'll be able to view it in hybrid log gamma. So it's going to show it in uh, the correct color space and the correct brightness if your TV is capable to do it. Uh, if you're working with a standard monitor that doesn't have HDR capabilities, you can come in here and select mode one and mode two, depending on which part of the image you're trying to expose for and monitor with. Um, so you have a ton of flexibility with that as well. So from here, um, let's jump into a couple of the other uh, simple functionalities on these cameras, and then we're going to wrap it up for this week. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about here is the difference between constant preview and live view boost. Um, depending on how you're using the camera, whether you're a photographer or a videographer, uh, you may want to pick one over the other. 
uh, constant preview when we look at the kind of uh, functionality that that offers is going to basically match the shutter speed and the aperture in real time to show you what the image will look like as you change the settings. So the image will actually get darker, the depth of field will increase, uh, but a side effect of that is the shutter speed will also play an effect on the image playback. So if I change this camera into say um, photo mode here, so I'm in manual photo mode. If I come in and I turn constant preview on, which is again in the custom settings menu under monitor display photo, page one. If I turn this, uh, first I'm gonna go to set and show you what's in here. Preview while manual focus assist. Uh, this means that if you're using the punch in box while you're manually focusing for stills, uh, you'll still see the previewed um, depth of field changes and stuff. Um, I typically leave that off. But if I turn this on and now look at the image here, you'll see that I've got f2.8. I'm at 125th of a second. It's a relatively dark image. Shutter speed, 125th of a second, fast motion, right? But if I come in here and say, I'm actually going to change this to shutter priority because it's a little bit easier to demonstrate this. So if I'm in shutter priority, but I start lowering my shutter speed down to say, we'll go down to one second. Now, when I move my hand in front of the frame, you'll notice, uh, well, the shutter speed is fine. It's showing me a full image here, right? But when I come in and go back into, say, manual and look at it, notice how that image, one, it looks way, way too bright. So let's bring the aperture down here to make this image look a little bit easier to demonstrate this with. So I'm going to go down f11, let me drop my ISO to 640. You notice how everything's gotten kind of laggy on the way the image is previewing, right? So now if I bring my hand out in front of it, you notice how you're getting like this weird blur. So if I bring my hand slowly in, you'll see the hand is kind of slowly moving in and out of the frame. You're seeing that weird effect. But if I bring my shutter speed up to say something like 2.5, 2 See, it's still a little bit there, but it's still super laggy. That's because constant preview takes everything into account to show you what the exposure is going to be. Um, this can be great for photographers where you may be shooting and you want to get an idea of what light trails are going to look like. You can set this and say you have a one second exposure. You want to see, well, how far are those lights actually going to move in that one second? Uh, this will show you because you've got it set to one second. Uh, the image is going to move through. You're going to see the light trails there because the display is only going to refresh after it's processed to that one second image. Uh, you get the depth of field preview, so that is a benefit there. Uh, and depending on the camera that you're on, if you're on the S5, you can actually separate out aperture away from shutter. So you have a little bit more functionality there. Uh, but this has been the standard way that our constant preview has worked for a long time. Now, the reason I bring this up is that for astrophotography or nighttime photographers, if you're doing cityscapes or landscapes, something like that, and it's lower light, you don't necessarily want this because you could be running a 30 second exposure. You don't want the screen refreshing every 30 seconds and seeing the blurry mess that an image would come out as because one, you can't focus. Um, you can't move the camera because it's going to take all of that motion into account. So what we've built into these cameras is a newer mode. So when we look on here, I'm going to turn constant preview off. And the mode that I often use, and I've pretty much now moved solely uh, to with the camera, is using Live View Boost. Now, you'll see here it says the screen is displayed brighter than the image recorded in low light settings. Now, that's the key difference here. The screen is what's getting amplified, not the image that you're actually capturing. So, for the video shooters that love constant preview because you get an idea of what the image is going to look like, so that is the whole concept of what you see is what you get, this is the exact opposite of that. What you're seeing is not what you're going to get. Um, what you're seeing is the uh, assist mode that's going to at least help you be able to frame and set up your shot 
So it means that you have to rely on your metering tools more than actually what's on the screen to view with. So it's a little bit of a different way of thinking. If you're coming from film cameras or DSLRs, this is more of the way you're probably used to working. Um, but we felt that this is such an important thing to make sure you have in these cameras because live view, um, having the actual what you see is what you get is an incredible tool. But when you start pushing the exposures into long exposure work or astrophotography, it's not possible to do it without some sort of refresh issue on the cameras. So a lot of companies find different ways to do this. This is our way. So when I turn Live View Boost on, you'll see I have two modes. You have mode one, which is this screen is displayed, the screen is displayed brighter. However, the LCD and the LVF, so that's the uh, EVF and the rear screen, the frame rate is going to drop a little bit, but you're not going to have the shutter speed effect, um, if that makes sense. You won't have a one second refresh on the frames that the display is showing you, but it may drop down to say like 10 frames per second. So you're only going to refresh every 10, 10 frames every second, so it'll look choppier but it means that you can actually focus and you're not getting that shutter speed blur or light trail effect that you have in constant preview. Um, with mode one, it's a slight drop. It's not a major drop in uh, frame rate on the camera for the viewfinder or the LCD. So it's still incredibly usable. I use this a lot for the astro shooting that I've done for some of the sessions that we've done here in the classes I've taught. Uh, when the comet was coming around, I used this because that's the only way I was able to actually see the comet uh, through the camera because I didn't have an ultra long telephoto lens to really isolate the comet out in the sky. Then you have mode two, which will substantially drop the frame rate. Th mode two is what you're going to use if you're trying to do, say, a shot of the Milky Way and you're in ultra wide angle field of view, you know there's nothing moving in the image, but you wanna be able to get manual focus pinpoint on those stars, or uh, where this really comes in more, more in uh, handy is if you're trying to do more selective focus type things, like if you're trying to do uh, low light shooting at night, um, say you want out of focus stars in the background. So you want to have that starscape kind of out, you know, blurry in the background, but you want to have something in the foreground really tack sharp and focus. Instead of having to do it the old way, which was literally shine a flashlight on an area, find that and then manual focus or use the autofocus because low light autofocus is actually really good on this for photography. Um, shine a flashlight, find the point where you want and get the shot there. Um, but that has its own drawbacks. You're introducing a ton of light in a really low light scenario where your vision's going to get a little screwed up. Um, anyone that's done astro or long, you know, nighttime photography, you know what I'm talking about there. But what this will do is it'll use the lighting that's around and it'll just amplify the gain on the display. So you don't have to go through any of those process. You don't have to figure out, well, do I have a flashlight? Where do I point it? Do I hold it in the right spot? Get the focus right? It'll just use the available light and amplify it up so that you can manually focus. The cool thing with this mode is that you'll also be able to actually see the stars in the image where most uh, digital cameras, uh, they can't gain up high enough on the displays in their constant preview modes to actually see the stars in the sky. Um, so it's hard to focus on them. If you're using autofocus, like our Starlight AF, um, the uh, Starry Sky AF that we have in the camera, uh, they can work great if you're using autofocus in the 225 point area. Uh, but if you want to manually focus it, um, using live view boost is going to be a huge advantage for that. Uh, the last thing that goes in tandem with this, um, or actually the last kind of setup here is when you go into, um, the, oh, sorry, you go to setup, um, to actually go into the settings for this. You can use this in program aperture shutter or manual, or you can just tell it to only function in manual. Um, typically, I only have this set up to work in manual because I'm usually manual exposure for that kind of shooting, uh, but you do also have the option there. So the last thing that I always have to mention in tandem with Live View Boost is night mode. Uh, night mode on this will actually set the camera's display and EVF into red. Um, now it's not going to show on the HDMI out because that's full color on the HDMI out. 
Uh, but if you can see on my main camera, the screen is now red on the back of this camera, where if I change the monitor, you'll see it goes back to color. So this means that when you're actually out shooting in low light, like I said with that flashlight scenario, uh, your vision is going to be um, much better protected for shooting in low light. So as you get yourself accustomed to really low light levels, you're starting to be able to kind of see the environment around you. You can pick out the stars. Y your vision's good for low light. You don't want to be staring at an ultra bright screen, even if you've got the brightness all the way down on this. Um, it'll still really affect your ability to see around. So using night mode, um, one of the lesser known features on this camera, and it's a really fun setting to use uh, for astro shooting. Um, you do also have different other um, uh, functionality when you go into the menu here, uh, which we'll jump back onto the screen here. Uh, if you click on display for more settings, uh, you now also have the ability to even lower the brightness uh, darker. So if even at zero, if it's still too bright for you, you can still lower the brightness uh, even lower. So that kind of covers uh, a lot of the settings that I wanted to talk about today. Um, like I said, there are a ton more options uh, and you know tips that can be covered on all of the Lumix cameras across the board. Uh, but I felt a lot of the stuff and a lot of the way the conversations go online, uh, I think I hit a lot of the points that... Uh, I've been seeing a lot of people ask um, and that I've gotten personal questions for on the different forums. So I want to thank everybody. Thank everyone who has joined us throughout this year. Uh, it is the 31st, so it is New Year's Eve and we are finally done with this year. Um, though it's only a, a, a calendar year and, you know, it doesn't actually mean anything changes tomorrow on the first. Um, this has been an exciting, uh, journey for everyone here at Panasonic Lumix. Um, I am so excited to see how many of you have joined us and stayed with us throughout this year of doing these Lumix lives. Um, we've obviously gone through some rough patches with them where, uh, maybe the technical side of it wasn't the greatest. Maybe the content wasn't necessarily what you were expecting out of it. Uh, but we're always growing and building this channel. So I want to remind everybody that we have the, uh, email address lumix.live at us.panasonic.com. Uh, that, uh, already we've received so many questions and comments, uh, on that email address about topics that you all want to see us cover and talk about. Um, now, the email address is not to disparage you from actually commenting in the live chats. Um, we love having that conversation. Uh, but there's a lot of people that have given us the constructive criticism that, you know, we may not be getting to everyone's questions. So if you've got a question, if we miss it during a stream, if it's something that's uh, you know, maybe more complicated than we can answer quickly, you know, off the cuff during a stream. Send it to us in that email. Uh, we don't respond from that email, but know that we do get it. I see them come in every day. Uh, but that's what we build our programming off of. Um, if it's something that is uh, really, really interesting, uh, I may respond to it. It depends. Um, if it's something that is an issue, um, just as a warning, don't use that email address to send your issues to if you've got technical issues. Um, that's Those won't be addressed through that email address. You have to go to a service, uh, the service email addresses for those. But um, this is really just a way for you guys to help drive what this content is going to be moving forward. Um, again, I really appreciate all the conversations that you all have had in the chat uh, all of the support that you've given each other throughout the year. We know it's been difficult for everyone uh, in the working side, in the personal family side, being able to cope with everything going on this year. Um, I'm glad that some of you were able to join us and uh, hopefully just keep you know some level of uh, uh, enjoyment and happiness throughout the year with this. Uh, we look forward to coming back to our live sessions next week. Uh, which is actually on the 7th. So January 7th, we will be back uh, live with our actual, um, well, live streaming. Uh, so we won't be doing recorded. Uh, but what we may try to do uh, as we move forward is do some more of these recorded sessions throughout uh, for those more involved topics. 
Uh, so let us know in the comments uh, what you want to see us do in the future. Let us know at that email address if there are questions that you have that we haven't been able to answer. Uh, and as always, make sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon on all these videos. It helps us out tremendously uh, in growing this platform and continuing to bring you guys uh, new content, new products, uh, new technologies that we're releasing. Uh, and I'm really excited about some of the stuff we've got coming up. So we're going to start being able to have the actual calendar uh, of the streams that are going to be coming up further out moving forward. So uh, if you look in the Lumix Live playlist, you'll see a number of upcoming live streams. Uh, so you'll be able to know what we've got coming along in the future. Uh, and if you want to jump to any specific point in this video, uh, again, we've got all of the uh, uh, marks down on the bottom in the description with the timestamps so that you can jump right to a section. So with that, Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you guys next year.